Our next presenter is Jeff Ledbetter from Mark Baker International uh, Data Mark Group. So uh, Jeff is going to be talking to us about the data supply chain um, and regional data sets. And with that, I think we've got your slides on deck and we'll go ahead and turn it over to Jeff. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, glad to be here with everyone. Uh, Glad to uh, have the opportunity to talk about the concept of data supply chain and, and how it relates to regional data sets, in particular because we are engaged in that CAMS modernization project that was referenced um, and working with Rachel and her team to help her uh, identify the, the ways, the means that she needs to uh, create a regional data set, particularly around address points, but this idea of a data supply chain and regionalization of GIS data sets is not only about address points. I think we heard it all the way from Isaac this morning, uh, regionalization or aggregation of date GIS data sets at various levels, starting at uh, regional levels, moving into statewide levels, in national, international levels, is really something that makes a lot of sense and kind of represents the future of data management uh, and GIS, you know, and other uh, disciplines as well. And so uh, we're glad to talk about this topic. And I just wanna talk briefly about, and I know I've only got 20 minutes, we'll see uh, how fast I can talk uh, briefly about the, the work that we're doing in the project, uh, the LA County needs. And then Rachel uh, is actually gonna follow me up here um, and hopefully the concepts that I review here uh, will mesh well with her presentation, um, as well as uh, what One Spatial had to talk about as well as they're engaged in the project along with us. So it's the idea, regionalization of GIS data sets um, and the building of a data supply chain of any sort is really the idea of forced family functions. You know, cities um, who have their focus and their specific operations um, are thinking about their transportation needs, their public works needs, their public safety needs, any other departmental needs they have. Um, and then all of a sudden here comes a request from the county or a, from a regional entity, a SCAG or any, any other sort of regional entity that might try to, to get their data. Um, and so, it puts them together with their neighbor cities. They probably have a relationship with their neighbor cities, but they don't, you know, for instance, in Redondo Beach have a relationship with the folks in Lancaster because they're just not coincident um, on, you know, and they don't have a need to, to have a great relationship and be sharing data anyways. But from the seat of the county, you gotta have both, both data sets in order to do your job, uh, aggregate things, and so we want to talk a little bit about the roles that build that data supply chain aggregators, which would be the county in this example. Data, local data providers or suppliers would be those cities in this example as well. Have to think about not only the GIS, the technologies of how do I aggregate this data? What does our schema look like? What kind of feature classes are we going to uh, feature? Uh, how do you, my unique IDs not get confused with somebody else's unique IDs um, for public safety purposes, for addressing purposes, and other stakeholders as well? These are the forced family functions that we all have to get through. That idea being, well, we all love grandma, but we don't love our cousins. So we have to go be nice to our cousins while we get to, to spend Thanksgiving with our grandma. So... <laughs> forced family functions here in terms of data and building a supply chain are, are critical. We have to get along and be, uh, be able to build a relationship whether we know we needed it or not. It's really a question of change management. Not only change management as your head is down in your own needs as a city or as a, that data provider uh, or your own needs as you're that data aggregator, but it is about uh, managing the change on a, on a fluid basis across all of those roles. It's really key, the, the biggest key to success of any data supply chain is communication. Without communication, you can't know what to expect 
when to expect it and what kind of exceptions you need to prepare for in your um, your experience, again, whether you're that aggregator or that data provider. The thing that helps with that is a common operating picture to understand a common schema, right? Understand uh, how your data relates spatially, geographically to the data from the other cities as well. It's all about normalization. It's all about quality and making sure all things that need to be in common are in common. It's also about flexibility. And the flexibility that allows you as a data provider or a data aggregator to be able to do what you need to do the way you need to do it without having to force you to change your business process or force you to change your schema. Especially if you're the aggregator, you have to be flexible and be able to accept any kind of data that would come your way that's going to be useful. And so these are the challenges that we're helping LA County work through in terms of uh, how CAMS needs to be modernized. How can we establish a data supply chain from the providers at the cities and the county departments um, that is flexible, that is full of communication, that contains uh, predictable feedback loops so that they can be closed at predictable times in, in predictable ways. The challenges for providers are that you have to maintain the extract, transform, and load processes that are necessary to move from your business schema into maybe the one that gets aggregated. Increased frequency of error correction is going to be necessary. Um, if you're in the community development department, you only have to be, I'm sorry, the assessor's department, and you only have to be right once a year, you may need to consider having more frequent validation and error correction processes than uh, you may have in place now so that you can play nicely in these forced family functions. And you may need access to data adjacent to a da data adjacent jurisdictions. You may need to consider how that road center line comes along, what the block ranges are, how that impacts your address points, uh, in more in ways that you didn't need to before when your data set ended right at the boundary and you didn't have to consider how these play together. And then from the county's standpoint or the aggregator's custodial responsibility standpoint, they're going to be the ones that maintain that a similar ETL process that doesn't force the providers to change everything about their the way they do business. And it, map out and, and uh, challenge, the challenge will be mapping out and increasing frequency of data submittals. And they'll need also these adjacent jurisdictions to play together and figure out, iron out their differences, iron out their challenges in data quality together um, so that when it aggregates, it goes together nicely. One of the biggest issues in any kind of data supply chain is data quality considerations. Is all the data that you need available? Is it a complete data set? Does it reflect the real world? Is it accurate? And do you have it when you need it? All of this requires um, some what I call, refer to as cat herding or um, you know, multi-stakeholder considerations of how can I get the data that's available how can I help and facilitate, how can CAMS help and facilitate that data set becoming a complete data set, an accurate data set, and getting it when they need it so that it can be consistent between systems? Again, go back to Isaac's talk this morning from a statewide perspective. He's got these same concerns. How is he going to get data from LA County and Modoc County that's available to the level of completeness and accuracy that he needs it so that uh, not only things like NextGen 911, as we just talked about, have the data it needs, but there is a comprehensive data set that helps with contact tracing in the middle of a pandemic, that helps with uh, linear referencing systems for transportation departments, that helps with all the other business that statewide departments need. And from the perspective of the county that the countywide departments need, the public health department, the epidemiologist and others, that need that data. They can either create it themselves and have a duplication of effort and maintenance 
uh, or they can come together and create a data supply chain and an aggregated data set so that uh, things work well together. This requires uh, an, a, an assessment and documentation of data maintenance cycles um, where not only is the data validated on a regular basis, but iteratively corrected and improved, published to an internal enterprise and then aggregated to regional data sets. This is what the CAN system is uh, gearing up to do now as we help modernize the architecture there so that that aggregation can be as fluid as possible. Um, and it's really about people, workflows, processes, agreements, and systems. As data flows up and down this data chain, there's not only benefit to the aggregator, but the aggregator should benefit the provider as well. We talked about the, the need and the challenge for the local data provider to have um, access to adjacent data um, instead of having now a network of sneaker net you know, phone calls, hey, I need your data, I need your data. When it's aggregated to that regional county or state level, they have an access point then to get their neighbor's data without having to um, pull and query every so often uh, an activity that loses loses radar connectivity quite often, I'm sure, uh, in my experience, at least in those chairs. But it's all cemented and created and works because of effective workflows and processes that are built to cooperate and share data. Um, not only, you know, it's the, it's the natural extension, the logical flow of the concept of having an open data website is to build in some workflows and processes, commemorate those in documents such as agreements and have a system that aggregates those together and then shares out the results. So what's the value of a regional data set? I think we've heard it again, going back to the first uh, presentation of the day, that the value is in coherent sharing of data for multiple purposes. Build it once, use it many times. Build it once, use it for public safety. Build it once, use it for public health. Build it once, use it for the emergency operations center. Build it once, do all the things we need to do as a city, as a state, as a county with the data that we have. Uh, the the countywide address management system for LA County is as big as many states and as complex as many states. Um, and it requires as much efficiency as possible. And so the value of these regional data sets are um, at the LA County scale as valuable as, as statewide data sets because they'll be called upon to, to uh, perform similar functions. And if you're sitting in that local seat, you, you're not left out. You're not just because you're at the bottom of the chain. The value for you is that you get your neighbor's data. The value for you is that these workflows and processes force you to be better even for local needs because you are called upon to create workflows and processes that improve your data iteratively over and over, responding to the constant change of uh, the, the real world that is modeled in our GIS data. So that is the concept, uh, a quick review here, I know, but I see a couple of uh, comments or questions popping up here. Let's see okay. if I can get over here. Yeah, hey, I, I was gonna give you your five minute warning, but you, you Great. got through it pretty quick. So that's all right. <laughs> so um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A panel, but I do see some comments in some of the other, uh, in the chat window. Um, again, it'd be helpful if you can put questions in the, in the Q&A panel, that's easier for us to track. Um, well, there it is. But, but I think, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to think, look at these uh, things. So it looks like, uh, 
you know, more of a comment from Cynthia Cortez saying, thank you for advocating regional uh, data sets and it does matter. Um, and I think that's something we've been working closely with mm -hmm. Datamark and, and others on, you know, a number of projects in the county. Maybe Jeff, can you maybe comment a little bit more on that um, in some examples that you've been working with in, in these kinds of building of regional partnerships and data sharing? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we've been engaged in this project with uh, with Rachel and and the whole CAMS crew um, for a, two or three months now. We've held a number of regional events that include, you know, outreach to again internal county uh, departments, as well as those at the cities that would be these data providers, so that the county can aggregate. Um, we've really sought to uh, understand the workflow processes that are in place across the county so that we can make recommendations for how uh, not only the software and applications can be modernized, but the processes, the, the ETLs, the schema, and all of those technical ver uh, issues can be modernized so that the CAMS and the idea of CAMS that was launched you know, 10 years or better ago, are able to uh, are able to excel in a modern setting. Um, what that does is all to the end, end goal of, you know, having a regional data set. The question, what's a regional data set? A regional data set in this case is address points from all the cities and unincorporated area for LA County. That becomes really important for NextGen 911. Uh, and call routing based on uh, GIS data that Rachel's going to talk a lot about here in just a second. Uh, regional data sets also include things like road center lines that go also not only to the next 911 data set, but helps address points for uh, contact tracing and the other kind of spatial analysis you want to do against address data. Uh, linear referencing systems for the state and things like that. So those can those aggregated and when I say aggregated concatenated put together uh, cemented together data sets really matter. And um, you know dispatch systems and, and other things that uh, are in place for multi-jurisdictional JPA type organizations will need those as well. So um, those are the regional data sets I'm talking about. Um, and the CAMS project is a really fun and interesting one. And we want to invite anybody who isn't aware of it, but you, have, you think you might have data to contribute to it, to reach out to me, reach out to Rachel. She's up next, and we'll talk about it. But we're trying to herd those cats together, understand and document the processes that are in place, and then make recommendations to improve and modernize the software, the processes, um, identify the right people so that those five elements in the classic definition of a GIS are in place uh, for a successful and ongoing regionalization of addressing data across LA County. Great. Um, and I think, you know, again, I saw there was a question uh, about, you know, what is CAMS and some of that stuff. Um, and when we're talking about LA County, if you're not familiar with our geography, because you're from out of the area, we have 88 incorporated cities, we have our unincorporated areas of the county, we have other jurisdictional partners that operate within the county. Um, so when you start talking about bringing together common authoritative data sets for whether it is address points and street center lines as Jeff's been talking about or whether it's any other cross jurisdictional data. Um, it's really important that we have consistent processes and workflows and quality control on those data. So that as even going back to Isaac's talk this morning, we're, t we're all looking at the same information at the same time in the same way and we can make the best possible decisions from those data. Um, and I think that's that's where we've really found, you know, it's a it's a challenging process at a county scale, uh, at a county the size of LA, um, and and it's even a, a difficult process um, at a local level because you do yeah. need to know what's going on with your neighbors. And maybe Jeff, one thing I know you sort of talked through a little bit or, or referred to as NG911, and maybe for those who aren't familiar with the the high level, what is NG911 demanding us of us as local yeah. government? Yeah, so next generation 911 calls for GIS data to be used uh, 
in ways that it's never been in, used before and mission critical ways and life-saving ways that requires uh, accuracy and completeness of GIS data that's never been needed before as well. So in the past, 911 calls have been routed across copper wire networks. In the future, they'll be routed across IP networks. Yes, IP networks, the same ones that you've been using in your office since 1995. So <laughs> 911 gets uh, modernized as well. And so in so doing, then all of a sudden it can use the rich data sets that are out there in GIS format to do things like figure out where, where does the call to 911 need to go? Where does the text to 911 need to go? Where are the photos that you can now take of on scene? How do I send those to 911? The benefits there uh, will be amazing. All of the additional data that they'll be able to see in a 911 setting as well. So things like uh, pre-fire structure, pre-fire plans, building plans, um, uh, enriched location data from uh, all the different IoT devices that are out there, health telematics, uh, automatic crash notifications, and things like that. All of that will ride on and query GIS data in order to determine where does it send that IP packet to the next hop. Um, and without a, a base layer of address points and road center lines, uh, it, it's not going to work out very well. Yes, because you want your proper responder to know you've called, not the responder next door who may not want to come into your jurisdiction. Yeah. Um, that's sort of the simple version. Uh, there are two additional questions in the Q&A window, so let's address those uh, while we still have a couple minutes left. Um, have you dealt with connection issues for shared GIS data sets, such as pipeline data that cross jurisdictions? No, that's a, that's a good example, I think, of ones that um, should be part of some sort of regional data set to the extent that it's possible, um, because you're right. Pipelines are a great example. Transmission lines, utility lines, almost of all sorts, don't respect boundaries because they're utilities that need are needed everywhere, um, and those aren't in scope for CAMs, of course. But but it's an interesting question that we didn't really a, a address. But the same concerns about aggregators and providers uh, persist throughout. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have. It, when we think about it at the scale of large, you know, counties or statewide, um, all mm. these jurisdictional issues cross over many different kinds of data mm. sets. So um, we're, we're doing address points in 911 yeah. at the moment, but there's many others. Um, one last question. Uh, we have a couple minutes to answer. Um, is there a national authority that provides guidance on GIS data sets for interoperability? There's not a national authority that I'm aware of that, that's, uh, you know, authoritative, as you imply there. But there are some standards coming uh, that, that are, are out there now. Um, the National Emergency Number Association, or NENA, N-E-N-A, has published uh, a number of standards that are what are required for next year 911. That's probably as close as it gets. The FGDC also has an addressing standard that's very useful, but is much more sort of um, optional, not really a standard as in it will be required in order to work interoperability with any any given systems the way the nina standards are but they're a good standard as well to consider particularly about addressing and then i'm sure fgdc has many other types of, of standards that deal with other types of data as well that i'm just not as familiar with very good. I think we've answered all the questions and we're right about at the end of our time. So I want to thank Jeff again for the presentation and, and the Q&A. 